Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mimi Plochet, and I'm Artistic Director of the Chicago International Film Festival. It is my pleasure to be here today in conversation with two extraordinary filmmakers. Um, from Barcelona, Spain, we have Meritel Colal here with us today, and from right here in Chicago, Jennifer Reeder. Today's conversation is a collaboration between the Cultural Office of the Embassy of Spain and the Chicago International Film Festival. So a big thank you to the Embassy for your support of Spanish cinema at this year's festival. And we are very happy to be a part of the Embassy's Cafés Transatlánticos program. So thank you. Um, welcome, Meritel and Jennifer. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to start with quick, your quick bio so that everybody has a little bit of background on who you are and we'll get into um, kind of your approach to filmmaking and your inspirations and influences. So Meritel Colel studied audiovisual communication at the Pompeu Fabra University. In 2005, she received a scholarship to study at the University del Cine in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and we see that influence in her work. Driven by the need to explore the language of her personal diary, she made her first documentary film, Manuscript to the City, which is an essay on how to build a life in a foreign city. Mm. In Buenos Aires, she also began her professional career as an editor, working on two documentary feature films and also many collaborations to come. In 2007, she returned to Barcelona as an editor. She has worked on eight feature films. She's directed two medium length films and five short films. Her first feature fiction film, Con el Viento, also Facing the Wind, premiered at the 68th Berlinale Film Festival in 2018. It was selected for the Atelier Cine Fondation as part of the Cannes Film Festival and screened at more than 30 festivals, including the Chicago International Film Festival, two years ago. This month, it is playing in the U.S. as part of the Mujeres de Cine Online, so please check it out. She has recently premiered her film, Transoceanicas, at the Nara Film Festival in Japan and here in Chicago at the Chicago International Film Festival. It is a feature film composed of a film correspondence between Barcelona and Buenos Aires with director Lucia Vassalo. So right now she is editing her second fiction feature duo, which is a road movie through Northwest Argentina. So we're going to have you talk a little bit about all these films, but then about Duo at the end. So Jennifer Reeder. Jennifer Reeder constructs personal fiction films about relationships, trauma, and coping. Her award-winning narratives are innovative and borrow from a range of forms, including school specials, amateur music videos, and magical realism. These films have shown at film festivals around the world, including Sundance, Berlin, Tribeca, Rotterdam, London, South by Southwest, um, Venice, and the Whitney Biennale, as well as at the Chicago International Film mm -hmm. Festival. Her awards include several that have qualified um, her films for uh, Oscar nomination. Her most recent film, Knives and Skin, was theatrically released in France in November 2019 and here in the U.S. in 20, uh, December of 2019. She is also currently in pre-production for a new feature-length film called Perpetrator. Thank you for joining us, Mitty and Jennifer. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, I think your work is very different in terms of, I think, style and influences. And I want to get a little bit back into that in a bit. But one of the things that interests me so much is the way in which I think your work um, for both of you is very personal. So in some ways, you're processing an idea, an experience, maybe even a memory through your work. Um, however, again, the way in which you're processing it and the form in which you're choosing to do so is very different. So I wanted you to both talk a little bit about what it, what the personal means for you in your process and also in the narratives um, that you're creating. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that okay? <laughs> um, I'll have Jen sure. go first. Yeah, that's good. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I've never made a documentary. So, you know, in theory, all of my films are, are fiction, but <laughs> in reality, they, there is, there is autobiography in, in all of these films, whether it's something that has happened to me or something that I have um, observed or um, even, 
even speculative experiences, even, you know, writing characters where I am speculating on what's happening to them, that really does feel like, you know, you draw that, you draw from your, you know, you do draw from the personal. And, um, you know, I think that it's always, even as a teacher, it's always been really important to me, you know, when I tell my students to make work that is, that is personal, make work that's important to you. And mm. that, um, that there's nothing that is um, that is unimportant in terms of subject matter, you know. And I do think, um, you know, not that I sort of want to talk about what it means to also be, you know, like a a, a female, like a, a a woman director who deals with personal subject. That those things don't cancel each other out, or mm -hmm. or the idea of of being a woman in touch with, you know, your emotions and and you you funnel that into creativity. I think is is a re is really powerful for um, for all filmmakers. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, though, I get to decide. For instance, in a Q and A, what I tell my audience is actually part of my life. So it doesn't ever being able to. Um, you know, like, cha like funnel my films through my own body <laughs> really mm. doesn't ever actually make me feel vulnerable. Mm. You know, I never actually feel um, exposed because it's, uh, I mean, I, I am exposed, but you know, at the same time, it doesn't, the personal doesn't have to, to be, to be vulnerable in a way that is not productive. Right. Mm. What about you, Mary? Sí, uh, I, I will talk in Spanish, then Sergio will translate. Eh, estoy como totalmente de acuerdo con Jennifer eh, en que, bueno, yo nunca había pensado dirigir hasta que volví de Buenos Aires y sentí la, la necesidad de hacerlo, ¿no? Entonces, desde entonces, como ella, sí que hablo y creo mucho del vínculo, del vínculo que tenemos con lo que queremos contar, ¿no? Algo que nos atraviesa. Y también salir como de esa idea de la genialidad, de que somos creadores, que lo sabemos todos y que todo tiene que ser sólido y elogiar la duda, la fragilidad, la vulnerabilidad como centro de creación, ¿no? Que siempre la emoción esté en el centro y con eso, sí, todo, todo lo que se transita con esa, esa emoción. Entonces, en este sentido, el cine me parece que es un gran arte porque por mucho que trabajes sobre lo personal, eso es papel, ¿no? Es un lugar abstracto y lo tienes que llevar a la realidad para que eso acontezca, ¿no? Entonces, es muy bonito como el cine hace de lo personal algo colectivo y como individuo y colectividad se unen, ¿no? En esta ida y vuelta constante, tanto en el proceso de creación como con el espectador, con los espectadores. I in complete agreement with Jennifer. And I had not thought about directing until I came back from Buenos Aires and I felt the need to do it. And um, it's uh, very important to establish uh, this link um, with, uh, you know, what we're going through and what is crisscrossing us. So we have to always also get out of the idea of you are the genius, uh, you are creating uh, things. And we have to also you know, um, be mindful and uh, be in agreement with having doubts, uh, with feeling vulnerable, uh, with feeling fragile. We have to actually uplift that and we have to put it at the center. So emotion has to be at the center and we have to be able to transmit that. Uh, film is a great art and it's a place where you can take the personal um, which is something that is very abstract that can be on the paper to reality. And it's really beautiful how in cinema or in the film, you can actually take the personal to the collective um, through the process and in, 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 in the result. Yeah, because I mean, if you're not connecting with audiences and it's just exactly. then, mm -hmm. then, you know, as art, it's not functioning uh, as art and as in the way that storytelling can. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the other things that I'm so interested for both of you is kind of the influences that you're drawing from. I mean, I think you're both creating something that feels very unique and truly your own, but, you know, you can see that there's pieces of 
maybe different forms or styles or, or cinematic histories that are kind of uh, flowing through your work. Um, and that this really is, informs or is inflected in your aesthetics or the form of your films. So, so for you, Mitty, your first film was a diary film, mm. which was not maybe meant for, pers uh, for public consumption, but was uh, something that you made to process your own experience. Um, but it's also very connected with this film that we have in the festival, Trans Oceanicas, which yes. um, kind of takes that form but puts it into the epistolary form where you're exchanging diaries. Um, and as for you, Jennifer, as mentioned in your bio, you see a lot of this influence of maybe more popular moving image media from the music video to after school specials, um, you know, which we see maybe in kind of both the color palette and the subjects um, and the narrative format. So I was wondering if you could each talk about kind of what influences, you know, not that we're seeing on the outside, um, but, but things that have inspired you um, and influenced you in your work. Um, so yeah, I'll go first again. I guess that's good. So my, you know, I didn't ever go to film school. I went to art school and I mean, I was never making studio art in art school. I was also, I was making, um, you know, video work in, in art school. And so my provenance as a filmmaker begins actually in the art world. I was making work, you know, video film and video work that, that, that lived in an, in an, in an, in the art world in galleries and museums. Um, and, but while I was making these films in art school, I was surrounded by, by painters and sculptors and photographers, um, performance artists, mm -hmm. you know, who, for whom, um, you know, texture was important and color was important and building atmosphere was really important. And so those conversations were not lost on me. They still aren't when I, mm -hmm. when I go to build a world of my film. And I actually came to, to even, you know, video making in the art school context uh, by way of dance. I was a ballet dancer for a long time. And, and I feel like that, if you can't worry, she's back there. I have a, uh, uh, I'll bring her out. I have, a, I have a Maya Darren doll that someone made for me who also was famously a dancer who became a filmmaker. Um, and I do feel like that, that influence still exists. This idea that the frame is like the, you know, the proscenium arch and that blocking is like choreography mm. and mm. that editing is like, is also sort of putting these moves to something lyrical, like a piece of music. And I mm. use music, I've, you know, Maddie does too, like music is really important to sort of travel the film along, not just in terms of a kind of narrative pacing, but also um, in terms of an emotional mm. pacing. So, you know, so that that's been influential, and I and I still am. You know, if you look at the the like the lookbook that we made for Knives and Skin, there's um, you know the figurative paintings of Jenny Seville, which are these beautiful goopy um, you know figure paintings, and and we looked at a graphic novel called Paper Girls, which is this really very highly color saturated um, you know graphic novel, and and. Um, you know, we, we, the, the influences were, um, you know, we, we made playlists of music to sort of become, mm. you know, to think about how you enter that, the world of that film. And, you know, certainly there's, there's other filmmakers who are influential, but that's not the first, that's never the first thing that I, that, that, that we build from, you know, it's really much more of a visual world. And I think that because I didn't go to film school, sometimes I regret that because teaching yourself how to write a script and to direct can be very exhausting, but it's also allowed me to kind of bypass the, some of the, um, you know, some of the rules or the conventions that, that don't, that, that, that maybe can, um, can make another another filmmaker's film, you know, be less, um, you know, vibrant or, or internal, perhaps. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like we certainly see that there are all, all of these influences. I love the way that you talk about the choreography because, mm. yeah, there is like a certain like movement in your films. And I mean, the color palette always stuck out for me music but you know thinking about the influence of dance and choreography and and, and, and the theater you know like theater mm. lighting the idea of like theater lighting and like costume you know really costume is is um feels like the theatrics of of ballet are you mm. know are always just like <laughs> just right 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 down, right on my shoulder right great what about you Mitty? 
Pues hay muchas influencias. La primera diría que es vital y que tiene que ver con el proyecto, un proyecto que se llama Cinema en Curse, de pedagogía del cine, donde desde hace 15 años acompaño procesos de creación de chicos y chicas jóvenes y eso me, me transformó la visión, digamos, de la creación. Y, y por, justamente porque es un cine muy intuitivo y, y muy libre. Por otro lado, Mecas fue el cineasta <ríe> que me acercó a esa otra forma de hacer y junto con Mecas, como grandes revelaciones en mi vida han sido Chantal Ackerman, Usia Usien o Rossellini. ¿no? Son como momentos de esos en los que algo te cambia en la vida. Como cuando vi Pina Baus bailar en directo, que también me cambió la vida. ¿no? Y como Jennifer, eh, entiendo el cine muy ligado a la danza. ¿no? Esa idea de los cuerpos que crean espacio y crean temporalidad. Y el cine es, es un arte de cuerpos. Eh, y me parece muy interesante también salir del cine y trabajar sobre poesía, escultura, pintura, música, evidentemente, y danza. Eh, para que las películas salgan de la narrativa más clásica y de todo de cosas que tenemos preestablecidos y como cinéfilos nos pasa mucho que siempre estamos referenciando otras películas y, y poder concebir desde otro lugar. So I have had many influences actually and the first one which has been very important and very crucial it's um, it's a project, a cinema in course, in which we teach um, filmmaking to, uh, to young people. Mm -hmm. And I've been working in this for 15 years. So that kind of transformed my vision of the creative process because it, it is a very intuitive uh, cinema and filmmaking that is really free. And also Mecas, uh, this filmmaker has been very influential in my work as well as uh, what I, when I encountered Chantal Ackerman and uh, people like Rossellini, uh, they definitely changed my uh, view of uh, filmmaking. And then also in terms of uh, dancing, when I saw uh, Pinas about dancing, and just as Jennifer was saying, the uh, film, it's linked to dance very much. And, um, you know, just like bodies create uh, spaces and temporalities, movies and films also do the same thing. It is um, the art of the body uh, in, in, in a way. So I go to poetry, to music, to painting, to sculpture, to, to dance, to actually get inspired and go beyond, um, you know, the narrative form. Um, so we always, um, make references back to other uh, films, but you know, these, uh, going back to these forms allow us to actually go beyond that and come from a different uh, perspective. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because um, in Con el Viento, I mean, she's a dancer, your, your lead character is. Um, and I love, you know, I think one of the things when we first saw that film for the festival two years ago, what really moved us was, how you so beautifully incorporated dance um, and that movement into the um, narrative um, of the film. But one thing I think you're both touching on is kind of, um, there's an intuitive nature to both of your filmmaking um, or you're inspired by this idea of, of the intuitive rather than kind of a very formalistic um, or historical or film school approach to making cinema. And um, you know, you're also both um, teachers. And so as, and so Miri touched on this, but this was one of my question is how does the, your experience as an instructor, teacher, professor um, impact your own work and the way you think about it? So I think Miri touched on this already, but if there's anything else you would like to add, that would be great. Mm. Claro, por ejemplo, cuando acompañas procesos creativos con personas que descubren el cine y hacen cine por primera vez, es muy bonito porque te conecta con la esencia de esa primera vez y con el descubrimiento constante. ¿no? Entonces, es como volver a esa primera imagen, ¿no? como volver a los Lumière y a ese primer contacto eh, cada vez. ¿no? Y por otro lado, en la universidad, por ejemplo, que también doy clases en la universidad, 
lo que me parece impresionante es, es esa otra forma de entender el mundo y esa otra mirada de, la, de las personas jóvenes. Eh, las chicas jóvenes son muy power, o sea, son muy, muy power y, y te hacen estar constantemente ¿no? cuestionando la realidad, el cine, los procesos y eso, quieras que no, te hace aprender muchísimo. So, uh, for example, when, you know, what has allowed me to do is uh, when I accompany creative processes, it's like, um, you know, accompanying that first time of discovery of, and it allows you to connect to the essence of that first time when you encounter something, you discover something. And it's uh, when you're teaching, because you're teaching people who are just starting, you are, mm -hmm. you know, encountering this uh, first time, uh, or, you know, constantly, mm -hmm. this discovering mm -hmm. of the first time. So it takes you back to the, you know, image of the Lumiere, and all those kinds of things every single time. Then I also teach at the university and something that has been very impressive to, um, to me is um, that I've been able to see young people, especially young women, this different way of understanding things and the, re the world and the reality, especially women. Women are so powerful, <laughs> you know, power is very important to them. So um, it's, they actually are questioning constantly the reality filmmaking, the whole process. Great. I want to come back to talking about kind of women in cinema, but Jennifer, I would love you to answer first about kind of this thing. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, at the very least, I, I agree exactly with what Maddie said. Like, at the very least, you, ha you are having brand new conversations, you know, every week. And, you know, I, I there was some, there was like a, a meme that was going around on social media last week or the week before that said something like, if you're over, th if you're older than 35 and you don't have a mentor who's like younger than 20, then you're doing it wrong, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, I feel like that, that sort of like, you know, I mentor my students, but then they, they also, you know, mentor and in influence me back in those mm. conversations that you have in a classroom where you're showing, um, a student, you know, you're sh showing students a, um, a film, you know, that they've never, and a, maybe even a kind of film that they've never ever experienced. Um, mm -hmm. That that is, you can see then when the lights go back on that you that they have that they literally there's a line that's been drawn from their heart to the screen mm -hmm. to those characters. And um, you know, I do the I do the responsible thing, and and I change my syllabus every semester. Mm -hmm. There's not something. You know, if I'm teaching a screenwriting class, there's not something that I think of as like the canon of films that we'll watch every semester to learn how to become um, a screenwriter. You know, I just am, I watch films all the time and I think like, oh, this would be a, this would be a great film, you know, to talk to my students about. Or, you know, conversely, I will, if I teach a, mm. in like an experimental production class, then I get to go back to all of this great you know, the early video art, Martha, Martha Rossler and Vito Acconci and, and, um, you know, Sadie Benning and, 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 and that work, you know, for, for students who are consuming, you know, YouTube and TikTok and other, other experimental short, <laughs> short video, like the moment that they realize that this sort of short experimental form has been going on for decades. You don't think that you can blow the mind of like an 18 year old until, you know, they see, right. They see Sadie Benning for the first time, or they see, you know, Martha, Martha Rossler for the first time, et cetera. And they, I just, you know, it's a, it's so, um, that's not lost on me, you know, that, that joy. And really, you know, especially when I'm talking to students about their own scripts and what's working in the script and what's not working in the script, in a way, then it it also can unblock oftentimes problems that I'm having in my own, you know, in my own work. The only thing I don't ever do is show my students my own work. You know, I'm just not I'm not strong enough to have a, a critique in my classroom about what's <laughs> what's working or what's not working. Um, some usually they find it there'll be a moment when someone comes to class and they'll say you know you've got a movie that's like 100 fresh on rotten tomatoes you know like signature <laughs> move. and that's 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 that that's a you know that's impressive to them but i but i that's where the conversation ends i don't i don't want to talk about it after that <laughs> um 
you know, Mitty, for you in the film, there's a, in Chen's there's this moment, you know, because it is very personal where one of your mentors passes away. And so I love thinking about how, you know, it's not just people who are older than you and have come before you and have taught you as your mentors, but also that those who are coming after you and can, you know, as you're mentoring them, they're also mentoring you. So I just, I, that just came to me when we were talking about mentorship. Mm. Um, we talked a little bit about music. So Jennifer, I'd love for you to start talking about, um, you know, the way that you use music specifically kind of the, the choirs. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, when I think of, um, kind of, you know, film is a, a collective art, you know, it's collaborative, you know, kind of the, I guess the idea of the choir works so beautifully as a metaphor for that. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about your interest in, in using this type of music and other types of music in your film. For sure. And I think, I think, I think that does go back to my, you know, my life as a ballet dancer, you know, mm -hmm. so from a very, you know, from seven or eight years old, you know, I spent just huge amounts of, of time in a dance studio, sort of, um, you know, like making sure that my body knew how, that my body knew how to respond to music. You know, yeah. I can't sing at all, nor can I play a musical instrument. Um, but I am, um, but the, 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 the impact of a, of a, of a choral voice and especially a young choral voice um, is that's not lost on me, you know, just the, the, the ability for a song, but in particular, a live um, choral song voices, um, the ability to, for that to, to transform is, is, um, you know, is not lost on me. And, you know, it's the way that those voices harmonize that kind of synchronicity it also comes back to dance, you know, I mean, whether, you know, you, it's nice to be a soloist, but also the rehearsing of a dance over and over again to make sure that everyone is in sync, you know, and even I find watching my, I follow probably ballet dancers more on Instagram than any other, than anything else. And I just find it very meditative to watch, to sort of go back and watch ballet dancers, you know, even rehearsing. Um, and, and for me in the, in the, in my stories, because my characters are often so beautifully flawed, I mean, I write them that way. That's not, it's not, an, it's, that's not a surprise to me once the film is finished, <laughs> but I needed to, I need to also provide for the audience a sort of um, a kind of a, um, a relief from this, these kind of unrelentingly flawed characters. And so then the, the singing moments become um, a reminder that, you know, in this very weird world, there is beauty, there's synchronicity, um, and there's harmony. And, and that, and that when we work together in an empathetic way, in a way that we're really truly listening to the other voices and trying to, to synchronize them, that that's actually much more, um, productive and powerful than sort of one person, you know, kind of leading, um, leading a charge. And, you know, when we were shooting Knives and Skin, some of those choral songs were recorded ahead of time, but a lot of them, the women were, the girls were singing, live singing on set. And, you know, those were very actually, genuinely emotional days, you know, mm. where just that voice would kind of get into mm. the, get into the bodies of everybody, even these big, you know, like the grip and electric guys were just <laughs> sobbing, you know, it was very, you know, it was very power. It was very powerful. And I, and I had worked out a lot of those, that the singing scenes in the, in short films that I have done leading up to Knives and Skin. So, so I, I'm a very cautious person in that regard. Maybe I, it's my, because I'm Midwestern or something like this, you know, that I, I, I had vetted that, I had vetted that through the short films, which, which people really responded to so that I knew when I was going to make knives and skin that I had to, there had to be singing. Yeah. I think a lot of filmmakers do that, not just from the Midwest, but you're right. <laughs> I mean, I wish I was more sort of spontaneous, but there's something that feels very comfortable for me, like to just sort of vet some of the more risky moments and see how they land. And if they don't land, it doesn't mean I abandon it. Sometimes I just like, put it on a shelf to say like, I'm going to work on that a little bit more. You know, I, I never give up. I never really abandon. I never, yeah, I never abandon anything else entirely. Yeah. 
Good, and maybe yeah, I think you know the way you're using music is very different. But you talk about that. Sí, sí. En en mi caso, por ejemplo, cuando en todo el proceso de creación hay muchísima muchísima música y también tenemos una playlist compartida. Con, por ejemplo, en este caso de dúo teníamos una playlist compartida con los dos actores. En Con el viento había también una playlist previa con la que escribía y después en montaje también retomé. ¿no? Es decir, que la música siempre acompaña los procesos y crea un universo, un universo de personajes y un universo también de ritmos, mm -hmm. pero luego nunca queda. <ríe> siempre se sustituye por por la música, digamos, natural, ¿no? es decir, el sonido que acompaña el, a los personajes ¿no? en su descubrimiento del mundo, es ese sonido que va trayendo un poco esa armonía ¿no? de la que habla Jennifer. Para mí está mucho, por ejemplo, en lo que puede traer un viento, en el eco que puede traer un viento, puede haber algo musical, ¿no? o cómo la música deja paso a ese viento y cuando aparece realmente, por ejemplo, esto que contaba Jennifer, que cuando haya un momento musical sea como eh, realmente muy especial, a nosotros en Con el Viento nos pasó la secuencia en el pajar, cuando ella está ahí bailando y suena parcel, de repente ahí pasó algo, ¿no? Eh, muy, muy mágico. So, in, in my case, uh, music is something that is always accompanying the whole process and the process of creation. Um, there is always, you know, a playlist that is shared with um, the actors or, you know, with the team. So, for example, in um, Con el Viento, uh, there was a playlist um, that was shared with the writer as well. And music is important because it creates this uh, universe for the characters and rhythms as well. And at the end, it never stays, that kind of music, you know, is substituted by other uh, things, by other uh, noises or music or things that happen. Um, so it's very important uh, because sound is something that is being discovered in that kind of uh, world. And it has to bring harmony and create that harmony. Um, so in, our, in the film, in the case of the film, uh, that happened with the wind. Mm -hmm. And uh, the wind, it's something like music as well. And it's that kind of sound. And it happened to us in the sequence of the dancer. Um, and the wind kind of created that universe for the dancer. And it made it very special. Yes, and also in the sequence with parcel. You know, for me, music becomes very important because there's a silence. Mm -hmm. you know? And then well, there's music, it's like... A well, I wanted to give you two the chance to maybe either ask each other a question or reflect on the others. Oh, good. Can I? I, I would. I'm just dying to ask you. Something. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Um, I mean, I could, or maybe there's. I, I will make an observation. You know that I think that it, it feels like you know, um, especially in this newest film. You know, obviously, what's prioritized is nonverbal language, so it's all written. And you know, in Knives and Skin, there's the, this happens also. And and in so many of my short films, I love um, translating lang translating a language that the audience can't hear. You know, and this and the idea of a kind of a that 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 um, you know nonverbal the nonverbal language is, um, you know, is very, um, is prioritized obviously. And it's in it. Um, so I, that's an observation. So I appreciate that. I feel like we have that in common. And then, you know, I think that, um, uh, well, I'll, I have two, I have two questions that one is, you, you know, I, I, I wonder if you have a sense of, of like, does the, does the footage find you or do you find the footage? Meaning that it feels like, you know, there's this way that your camera is an extension of sort of your 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 whole body, but there's these beautiful kind of serendipitous moments that happen where it feels like the 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 world that you're looking at through your camera is actually performing for you. You know that it's like I'm just thinking like, wow, did the did she find that or did that footage? 
you know, did that river do that for her? Or did the moon do that, you know, for her? Did the wind do that for her? Did the horses do that for her? You know? So that's my question. Do you think about, you know, whether the the footage finds you or the or you find the footage? And then a follow-up to that is also I'm I was so curious, you know, because um there's you also expose the process of editing, you know, the the footage. And I love that you're using Final Cut Pro. I still use Final Cut Pro. <laughs> I am hold, I'm holding on to a very old version of Final Cut. But I was wondering about how you organized the footage in your in the bins, but if you gave the footage kind of conceptual names, you know, like maybe the footage of of inside a certain department did it, did you name that bin, you know, footage inside the apartment or was it something that was like um, a much more conceptual name? I just had a sense that the way that you might organize your footage actually in Final Cut would have its own kind of conceptual story. Then, uh, yes, we have to talk about non verbal lang language. It was uh, crazy. In en, en el caso de Transoceánicas, decidimos dejarlo escrito, gran parte, porque no es lo me o sea, el lenguaje cambia muchísimo cuando se escribe que cuando se habla. Y entonces, nosotras queríamos hacer esa diferenciación, como una piensa cuando escribe y como una piensa cuando habla, ¿no? y, y esa diferencia de tiempo del lenguaje. ¿no? So, yeah, so, yeah, so, the, uh, so in Transoceanicus, um, we wanted to leave the um, writing um, because the language changes a lot um, when you speak or when you write. So we wanted to reflect that when the person is um, writing what she thinks and when she's speaking what she thinks. Yeah. Um, entonces, Footage find me or I find footage. Claro, vengo del documental y a mí lo que me acerca al cine es, es mi pasión por descubrir algo en lo real. Entonces, siempre rodamos en orden cronológico, es algo para que el presente siempre esté presente, digamos, y pueda modificar lo que vendrá. Y por otro lado, eh, o sea, es una locura porque estoy permanentemente reescribiendo. Entonces, si un día hace mucho viento, dejamos de rodar la secuencia que estaba pensada para ir a buscar planos donde el viento mueve el trigo, ¿no? Eh, y después hay esos momentos de armonía con la naturaleza donde subes, hay una salida de sol y los caballos te miran. Y eso no se puede... O sea, es la realidad la que te encuentra y no tú la que la encuentras, ¿no? Pero sí que hay algo de lo que decía hermano Olmi, que es un cineasta que a mí me gusta mucho, ¿no? la postazione, que es este estado de observación para dejar que las cosas acontezcan. ¿no? Y poder coreografiar, pero siempre dejando lugar para que la realidad coreografie contigo, ¿no? con, con todo el equipo. So I come from documentary, so I have this passion of uh, discovering something in what is real. And when I film, we try to do it uh, chronologically so that the present is always uh, present there and to, so it can modify what is coming next. Um, however, I'm always rewriting as I'm filming, right? So because sometimes things appear, for example, the wind, right? The wind, uh, you know, blowing the wheat, for example, it's something that uh, it, it comes and we 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 you know work around that or with that because we're trying to find uh, harmony with nature as well. So it's like reality is finding you, right? Um, and I'm sorry I did not get the name of the person. Her Hermano Olmi. Hermano Olmi. He talks about apostagioni, which is um, okay. And Mary, you'll have to explain to yeah. me what apostagioni oh. means. It's an observation, no? A deeply observation to stay there, to wait, to para que acontezca, no? Eh, sí. So a deep observation to wait so it comes to happen. That's mm. what uh, the concept means. So it is um, a way of kind of playing with chore chore choreographing reality and reality mm. choreographing. <laughs> 
<laughs> with you. Yeah. And editing. Okay. Uh, I film a lot. Then editing process is uh, crazy. <laughs> Eh, con Ana, que es una montadora con la que me gusta muchísimo trabajar, tenemos todo de frames, de fotogramas, en papel, todos impresos, de todos los planos. Entonces, la forma de pensar la película siempre es visual en una pared y que te permite jugar ¿no? con el orden constantemente. Y en relación a transoceánicas, Tenía ordenado el material por conceptos, según me lo mandaba Lucía o lo que tenía yo, y me di cuenta de que era un error, porque no dejaba las imágenes ser lo que querían ser o relacionarse como quisieran relacionarse, ¿no? Ya les daba como un concepto previo. Entonces, las volví a organizar cronológicamente y ahí aparecieron nuevas relaciones, ¿no? Y de alguna forma también era más honesta en cómo se había tomado ese material. Se había rodado de una forma y esto que tenía antes el montaje sobre cámara, que las imágenes pueden ser azarosas, pero hay relaciones muy bellas entre ellas, intentar recuperar algo de eso. So in terms of editing, so um, I work with uh, Anna and um, we work with frames and uh, photograms, meaning we always have uh, everything um, Pr uh, print okay. printed on paper of the planes and we then uh, put them on the wall and to see you know to have it uh, visually there and we can then play with the order once they are on the wall in terms of transoceanicas so um, I order things by concepts right but then I realized it was a mistake um, so because I was not allowing the images to be Uh, what they wanted to be or to relate to the other images the way that they wanted to relate to the other images. So I went back to a chronological order and uh, that's when I started uh, seeing new relationships between the images uh, to appear. And it became a more honest uh, process uh, and, and how it was also filmed. Uh, it kind of represented how it was filmed and that you know uh, the image um, the different images that appear there some of them were really beautiful and see how they create a relationship among them yeah and that makes sense i would just follow up quickly to say you know you develop a relationship with your hmm. footage as you're cutting it right And it ch it changes, you know, it changes. And and I just, I've worked with the same editor for a long time and we end up giving like nicknames to <laughs> yes. certain scenes, you know, that aren't, that aren't related to what's happening in the scene, but it's something that it's, it's some, it's some way that we've developed a relationship with that scene. And then that scene gets a nickname somehow that then oftentimes allows it to relate to another scene that's transformed itself yeah. over the course of editing. So Um, yeah, it just felt like you have this way of you shoot you shoot the footage and then it seems like I mean there's so many beautiful um, like superimpositions and cross dissolves mm. in this film that I and I love doing that as well that I just knew that that you 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 have one way of working with the footage when you're shooting it but then when you're editing it you're creating a, a compl all new images it's yes. it's sublime it's a sub, it's, it's a totally sublime film. Thank you. I have a lot of questions of your work but there's one that uh, i think it's it's i don't know how to say well o sea lo que quisiera saber de tu proceso de creación en general no solo de una película sino como proceso es desde dónde escribes, ¿no? ¿Cómo escribes? ¿Cómo es el proceso de escritura? Porque empecé viendo Knives and Skin y de repente vi todos los cortos y me pareció tan bonito ver escenas, movimientos, pequeños diálogos, eh, gestos que se repetían pero se habían transformado y habían evolucionado y habían cobrado un nuevo sentido, que me pregunté eso, ¿cómo, cómo es tu proceso de creación y de escritura? Y si hay una búsqueda constante y, y los cortos también te sirven para buscar y para escribir. So the question that I have um, is about your process of uh, creation or creating in general, not just one movie. 
Um, so from where, where do you start? From where are you coming from? Uh, because I saw, what I saw in an ice and um, skin is that there are certain uh, cuts or, or shorts that are really beautiful scenes that are, well, are, are scenes or movements or s small dialogues or gestures that are uh, repeated. However, they have evolved, they have um, been transformed, um, they have acquired new meanings. Um, so I'm wondering about your process of uh, creation and, and, and writing, if it's a constant search or how is it like? Yes, and if you use, if the short films was a source for the future film or, yes, mm -hmm. if you write. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And, they, and I don't mean to be a broken record to say that I think of it, I think of, you know, I mean, my films are all connected to each other. They are really a family, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, but I, just as in, again, just as in, you know, like choreography, you know, maybe there are these, there are, um, you know, repetitions in, in a full, you know, in a dance movement um, that build, you know, that build on each other. And that's done very, um, uh, strategically or very particularly. So there are, yeah, they're repeating, they're repeating characters, repeating character mm -hmm. names, um, repeating, um, even props, repeating bits of, um, wardrobe, even repeating yeah, lines of dialogue. Um, sometimes it's because in the short films, it's very, pra it's very practical, you know, that the short films, um, you know, where they've had this very nice life outside of the U.S. because there's this lovely culture outside of the U.S. that appreciates the the form of the short film as a as a fully fully formed you know project. Um, I know that some of those some of those lines of dialogue, if they exist in the short film, maybe they haven't had such a broad audience. You know, so mm. so when I was writing Knives and Skin, I thought, wow, I'm just gonna take that. I'm going to take that back from the short film and give it a new, give it a bigger life in Knives and Skin, you know? And because of so many of the characters in Knives and Skin were based on characters that I had been working out in the shorts, it didn't feel like I was, you know, plagiarizing myself. It felt like it was all part of the same, you know, this, the same family. Um, but I often, when I'm just at the very beginning of, of, of writing a film, I, 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 something visual will, will strike me. So in Knives and Skin, I, I was driving home. My mom lives in Ohio and I was driving, um, you know, home to see her along, um, like a two lane road in the middle of the countryside. And, um, I didn't see this actually, but I imagined a group of teenage girls, sort of misfit girls, you know, walking on this, in this landscape where they seemed at odds with the landscape, you know, like maybe kind of goth punk girls, you know, um, with lots of makeup and dressed in black, but who were walking along like a, a rural two lane road, either to school, home from school to another friend's house. And that image of a young woman sort of at odds at, with her landscape, just navigating one point to the next point, but with her friends, just felt like a very strong image to build around. And then I start asking, I'm like a detective. I start asking myself questions like, who are these three girls? And what is about to happen to them that will change their lives forever? And then, you know, I have, I'm always having these note, I have hundreds of these little notebooks where I just start writing those questions down. Like a, like I'm a detective who's both um, committing the crime and solving the crime at the same time. That's how I think about screenwriting. And I never write something from beginning to end. It's much more of a, a spiral. And it's always anchored, scenes are always anchored to something that begins with something visual. We, we, oftentimes from, from an either imagined observation or, um, you know, an actual observation, even though I've not made I've not made documentary films and I'm not someone who carries a camera around, you know, all of the time. I'm so envious of that. You know, I always forget like, oh, I'm a filmmaker. I have a, a camera on my phone. I could just be shooting footage all the time as just even a test. Um, but I, um, yeah, it's oftentimes it's either something I've imagined or it's, or it's something that I've watched that's, that's more visual rather than a, a, a something that's, that's something that's con conceptual, let, let's say. 
Y también como quería preguntarte, bueno, hay muchas cosas, como decía, lo del, es, me parece muy interesante el trabajo que haces con el género, ¿no? con el uso de los códigos de, del cine de género, pero transformándolo a otra cosa, ¿no? Y tienes como desde el coro que te lleva a la tragedia griega, evidentemente, porque has explicado un poco, y revertiendo esa idea del coro también y haciendo de lo colectivo un nuevo lugar, y también de los géneros, ¿no? De detectivesco, fantástico, de terror, hay como todo... Eh, sí, un, un universo muy único y a la vez que, que bebe de esos géneros, entonces esa era una cuestión. Y la otra sobre el trabajo con los actores y las actrices. Sé que los jóvenes son muy frescos, pero me parece muy interesante si hay un intercambio también de materiales, por ejemplo, con, con esas personas, con los intérpretes, o suele salir más del papel y, y de la repetición se lo hacen propio. So uh, there are many things that I would like to ask you, but I want to ask you about the genres mm -hmm. and um, how you know you use the different genre codes in cinema, and uh, how do you you know transfer from one or the other? So for example, from the chorus to the Greek tragedy, mm -hmm. right? And um, how you make of the collective a new place. Um, so yes, yeah, you use several genres: uh, detective, mm -hmm. sci-fi, terror, and um, out of all of those, you create a unique universe in your films. Of course, it's drawing from all of these different genres, but it is unique. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the questions: How do you do this? How do you uh, do this process? But the second question has to do with the uh, actors, mm -hmm. uh, the young art um, actors, female and male. And um, so if there is an exchange of materials with them or not, um, or if you know everything is coming out of the paper and then as they start you know, uh, representing it, it becomes uh, theirs and they can also add to it. Mm -hmm. Or what, how, how does this happen? Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I'll answer the, the question about the young actors first. And, and, and you know, what's been so what I what I love looking back at the short films that I've made with the young with young people and specifically the young women with the short films, I actually would cast a 14 year old to play a 14 year old. You know, so I was I was casting authentically, you know, and with a short film, it was easy because you can you know, we would shoot for eight day, eight, eight hours a day. It was not a feature length film that you really had to make your day and make the budget, you know, it had some flexibility. And so being able to cast authentically for those short films was really meaningful. And I liked being able to cast um, young people who didn't have a lot of film acting experience, but were dancers, were singers, were maybe theater actors. So they knew what they knew, what their bodies would do in the world and in front of a camera but they weren't so polished as film actors. And then I would cast them with a very experienced film or television actor as the adult. And then what would happen was that, um, you know, the, the young people would, you know, I mean, they, they would interpret the, the, the script in their own sort of way and give very fresh, you know, very, would deliver the dialogue in a very fresh way, which would be often, a kind of a surprise to the adult experienced actor. So then their response, their, their reaction in the dialogue would also be really genuine, but, but a little more refined. And then that sort of refined answer would, I mean, it was a real like beep, boop, beep, boop, you know, watching some of that play out. I mean, it's not to say that then I didn't step in and direct it or say, okay, I like how that, that's the way to play this scene, you know? Um, but the freshness with which, you know, those young women, you know, would perform and it would change day to day because there would be days very specifically when a young woman would get dropped off by her mother who she was having an argument with. And that would totally influence how she performed that day. It was like, I loved it. I didn't find it at all distracting. I really loved that there was a sense of, of um, absolutely no hesitation in like bringing the baggage of their lives onto the set because it was also about young women navigating these adults. Um, with Knives and Skin, 
I love the performances from the young people in Knives and Skin, but because of the constraints of shooting a feature length, you know, we had to cast people who were, you know, at least 18, if not, you know, much older to play the young people, but they, but they were, and I thought I was worried that we would lose, that I would lose some of that spontaneity or some of that kind of awkwardness in the, in, in the, just the instinct that the younger people had. Um, but we, but we didn't. Those, you know, the young people in Knives and Skin, you know, they're such good. They're all very experienced actors, mostly in theater, which I also think makes a difference because theater people also have to be, they have to read a room, you know, they have to really understand what's happening in the temperature of the audience and like change the performance quickly. So, you know, we cast all of Knives and Skin out of mostly the theater community in Chicago. And I just am so in awe of those performances, you know, because it's they're so risky and they still were very, very spontaneous and very much about that continuing that deck. Doot, doot, doot. Um, and then, oh man, I've, I've forgotten your, oh, the genre. Okay, so I'll, I'll try and be, be brief with genre. I mean, what I love about, about working with, in genre is that it just allows you to kind of break out of reality. You know, that I'm not beholden to, I'm not beholden to, um, to keep anything so grounded in reality, you know, because sci-fi is fantastical, you know, horror is fantastical. Um, the musical is, a, is fantastical, you know, so it's like, um, it's like genre and even jamming genres together allows me to create a world that, um, that doesn't have to be based in in reality because you know cinema is art cinema for me is is artificial and if you're not creating if you're not creating an experience where the audience really is transported someplace else for a certain period of time i mean it's bold to say you're doing it wrong but it's just not my it's just not what i what I want to do as a maker. I mean, having said that, I also, for instance, I am so envious of the films of someone like Deborah Granick, who, you know, who really is dealing with fiction, but realism, you know, it's a real kind of um, social realism. And I, I just, it seems like this impossible task, I would never be able to do that. And so I know that what I'm much better at is, is um, using genre as this kind of curtain for a story and then you pull the curtain back and you just go into, you know, my, my personal wormhole for a while. And it's truly, you know, Knives and Skin in particular is a film that, you know, it either people really love it or they just don't get it. Literally, they don't get it. I think it's like, there's a frequency in that film. I think of it as like either waves or like double Dutch, you know, this jump, this jump rope game that uses two ropes. Like you either can, <laughs> figure out how to enter the film and and you can get into the frequency or you can't and you're like just wrapped up in the ropes and it's very frustrating um which is fine i would love for everyone to totally love it but i get it um that you can't and right now there's nobody in between which is also fine with me Great. I wanted to, we're running a little bit out of time here. So um, I just was wondering if you could just both do a quick preview to the films that you're working on at this moment. Um, and then we'll tell audiences how to so see I'll the just, films. I'll just say quickly, doing. since we were talking about genre. So the next film I'm doing, Mimi, you, you mentioned it, it's called Perpetrator. Um, we were supposed to be shooting it right now, but of course pandemic um, changed that timeline. Um, but it's a, a coming of age um, shapeshifter story, very sort of you know nuanced um, shapeshifter story uh, that um, was sort of inspired by Cat People, the multiple iterations of, of, the, of the film Cat People. Uh, but it's a proper genre film and it's actually, unlike Knives and Skin, it actually is more grounded in, in, in reality so that the shape-shifting aspect of the film, which is pretty magical and surreal, can kind of have its own its own life. And it's um, and I have a, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with the pr producing team, which is partially based in Paris, although we'll shoot it in the United States. Um, and 30 West and Divide and Conquer are, are involved as well. So it's, it feels like a really bigger, bolder, more ambitious leap from Knives and Skin, but I'm very, I'm very happy to make that leap. So the next one is called Perpetrator and it's a proper shapeshifter genre film. And Mary, I know you also have a film that's been impacted by the yeah. pandemic. Yes, uh, we were shooting at Argentina Desert and we were, the pandemic arrived and we have to cut the shooting time at the middle. 
And now we are editing the movie and we are rewriting with the footage we have. And Duo, I, I, I pass to Spanish. Eh, Duo es, retoma el personaje de Mónica, la protagonista de Con el Viento, y cuenta la última gira de danza de Mónica con Colate, su pareja, después de 24 años compartiendo escenario y, y pareja. Y entonces en esta gira que emprenden por la puna argentina en frontera con Chile y Bolivia, digamos que el contraste entre el campo, lo rural y la cultura popular andina y ellos intentando hacer un espectáculo de danza contemporánea ahí, eh, evidencia lo absurdo de su relación y de estar haciendo arte de esa forma allí. Y en Mónica abre otro universo en todos los sentidos, otro universo que tiene otra textura que es el Super 8, eh, de, de un viaje como para aprender a decir adiós y a reconectar con las raíces. So, in terms of duo, um, so we are retaking Mónica uh, right from uh, Con el Viento. And um, so she's, um, you know, going to do a last tour of dance, of dancing together with her partner, Colette, um, of 24 years of sharing, uh, you know, stages and, and sharing uh, dance. So they go to the Puna, Argent uh, Argentinian Puna, which is in the border between Chile, Argentina and Bolivia. And um, they are trying to uh, play contemporary dance or do contemporary dance in the middle of the fields, the countryside, something that is very rural. Uh, so then uh, at some point it becomes very absurd, but it also uh, represents her relationship that has also become uh, absurd. absurd. And um, so Monica discovers, and actually this is filmed with Super 8, so it has a different texture. And she's uh, discovering a way to saying, goodbye um, to, you know, her partner and yes. Great. Well, we look forward both to seeing Perpetrator and Duo when they're ready. Uh, in the meanwhile, I would like to encourage everyone to see Transoceanicas, which is playing right now at the Chicago International Film Festival online through this Sunday. So please check it out. And also Con el Viento, which is playing online as part of Mujeres de Cine film series. Um, through no, uh, November 27th. So thank you so much to Jennifer and Meditel for joining us here today. And a big thank you to the cultural office of the Embassy of Spain. Um, have a great afternoon. And I loved hearing you both speak about your work and also your reflections on each other's work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bye.